Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Jason Park with the Hypertube Podcast. Today, I have a special guest, Adam Lopez. He is an actor, writer, director, producer. I mean, he has credits in almost every single field on his IMDb. What's up, man? How are you doing? What's up, Jason? Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, man, absolutely. So, you know, you've been acting for a while and a lot of projects and all that stuff. So, like, how how did you get into it? Where was your beginning started at? Sure. Yeah. No, I, um, I guess I, you know, I've always shown that I was interested in performing at a really young age. Um, and it wasn't until high school that I kind of took it seriously. And I started taking, you know, drama and doing the school plays. And while I was doing the school plays, um, there was a gentleman, um, who was an instructor there who suggested I do like voiceover work. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was like, you, you probably re be really good at it. And I was like, I don't know, 15 at the time I hadn't went through puberty yet. So I sounded like I was 10. Right. Right. And, um, and I went in for an audition for a Florida orange juice commercial and, um, I booked it and it was a national like voiceover campaign, um, for that brand. Okay. And I, that's when I read, I made some money, right, you know, right, I, was like, right. oh, yeah, I, uh, I bought a car, you know, with that money. Um, and I was like, oh, this, this is serious. Uh, this, you know, there's a, definitely like, this could be a career. Uh, what year was this around what time frame? 2001. Okay. So very different landscape within that space that I would say a lot of new actors, uh, wouldn't have had the pleasure of, of experiencing because the money in commercials at that time. And was good. yeah. And even being an extra, a uh, uh, SAG extra, was good so uh elaborate about okay so that that was your your moment of like hey i can make money on this and then elaborate like what that journey was like in those early years um well i mean you know that kind of showed me like that that was serious that i was serious and then i i graduated from high school and i thought well i should probably get a degree because i was guess backpedaling and second second guessing whether or not i was in florida i was in orlando i grew up here um, and I went to community college and I was miserable. And, um, and then at that point I was like, all right, let me do some independent films. So I, I, you know, at the time people were posting stuff on Craigslist that was, you know, kind of legit. Um, and then I did that for a few years, uh, full sale. There's, there's a school called full sale here in Orlando. There's also UCF Valencia. There's a lot of like within a triangle, there's three different film programs um so there's a lot of student films being made here and i did a bunch of those and after doing a lot of those student films those guys were like you know you're pretty good at this you should probably go to la and i had put together enough footage for a demo reel so right. i was able to get an agent before i even moved to la and i think it was well 2010 mm -hmm. and i was like let's let's drive across the country and see if we can make my dreams come true so how was that experience, you know, leaving Florida, uprooting and going to L.A.? What, what What's the time frame on uh, you traveling, uh, going to L.A.? So I landed in Los Angeles, July two, 2010. OK, OK. Um, and I, I went out there 2006. So I was just, okay. I was just curious. Sim similar time frame, similar industry. It hadn't it didn't fully convert yet to what it is today. But OK, so what was that experience like for you? Sure. No. It, where did you live in LA? Just out of curiosity. I, I lived everywhere, man. So for me, it started in Granada Hills and then okay. from the Valley Van Nuys and all that stuff, um, yep. used to be the porn industry. And then from there yep. it was Hollywood, a, a uh -huh. kind of couch surfing and bouncing around in Hollywood. Then it was Los Feliz. Then it was Pasadena. Um, yeah. and yeah. Then eventually I moved all the way to Orange County. Yeah. I, uh, that's funny. Cause I, I lived in a lot of those different places. I lived, I started, I was in Burbank for a few months. That roommate situ situation didn't work out. I landed in Pasadena. <laughs> and hopping, I, hopping. <laughs> and then I went to Los Feliz, mm -hmm. which is like on right next to Griffith Park on and, the backside there. Yep, yep. Um, and uh, Atwater Village specifically. Mm -hmm. And then I lived there for the longest. I was there for six years. And then I moved to, oh my God, where did I move to after that? Not near Venice, but it's Century City. Okay. And then Van Nuys and then Studio City and then Hollywood. Oh. And Hollywood was my dopest apartment. Yeah. But um yeah, dude, I you know, 2010 I got out there and um 
I was eager, you know, so I was like, well, first of all, let me get a job. So I got a job at Boston Market near Warner Brothers. And that was awful. But, you know, it was enough to, you know, help me survive. Um, I had an air, I slept on an air mattress, like, for an entire year, because yeah. I just was making enough money to basically to eat and pay rent. Um, and auditioning, start auditioning, not, not, not as much as I'd like, you know, I was getting maybe one a week, but you know, I, because Orlando, uh, you know, guerrilla filmmaking and student filmmaking, I was like, I was down to do whatever. So I did a lot of independent films. Okay. Um, and so I did um, a film called, um, played a cholo gangster in a film called fifth street. You were just eager to be on set. Dude, I was just down, dude. Like, yeah. I was, I'm still down. Like, like, um, the money was not the motive for me. I just wanted to get out there. You know, I didn't really care about a big paycheck. I did a lot of little stupid things. You know, I did a dating show when I was out there that was on CBS, I think. And that was an interesting experience. Um, well, that's, that's the thing that people don't realize, right? It, when you're new and you haven't established yourself as a name that people actually know, right? Eventually, what people don't realize is when you when you do so many auditions, these casting directors start to know you. Uh, yeah. They start to recognize you. They know what you're going to bring to the table. So they call you in to see if the client likes you. But what, yeah. what people don't understand is, you know... It, it, some of the greatest opportunities that will ever come your way or even memories in hindsight that you'll ever have will come from the eagerness of not worrying about the dollar. So yeah. uh, what I notice a lot of times, especially like in Facebook groups for like actors and production and all of this stuff, they're like, hey, don't do free work, know your worth, all this stuff. And it's like, yes, everybody wants to get paid. Everybody wants to have budgets to pay people properly. But sure. sometimes the ambition and waiting for the finances to feel that ambition don't match and then you just yeah. go with the ambition to go and get that project done yeah it's i i, I agree dude like i mean like I, I like i said i started doing student films and i probably did like 30 of them and out of those 30 four of them were usable for my demo reel mm -hmm. the, the sound quality was good the cinematography was good um sorry i have a gnat somewhere in here uh, Florida. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and if, if it was about the money and me feeling like, well, I'm worth whatever my day rate is and having no experience, then I wouldn't have been able to get that demo reel put together. So that became I mean, invaluable at some point, right? 100%. I mean, yeah. like I had a legitimate agent, you know, out there and I, then I, that led to having a legitimate agent led to me getting non-union commercial work, mm -hmm. which was kind of coming up the, the SAG scale commercials, you know, these guys, these producers were figuring out, well, we could just buy out our talent. Um, and so I ended up getting, I did a Bud Light commercial for the Super Bowl, and they bought me out. If I was SAG, you know, I would have been getting incredible residual money. But at the time, you know, making $8,000 for a day of work was like dope. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, with your Hollywood apartment, that was at least five months of rent. You could stretch, sure. you could stretch that out and and make it work. Well, I mean, you know, it's like I don't know if my experience in LA was that I was always playing catch up financially. So if I'd get a big check, it was like, all right, let me pay off these credit cards, mm -hmm. and then it was like back to square one type deal for me. Um, Same situation. It, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, the landscape I feel like was changing at that time. I feel like. It was a lot of non-union commercials, and I had the most success commercially doing non-union. Um, you know what's fascinating about that? I know that now we're like 10 years later. Um, I feel like because I I make indie films, and yeah. I feel like there's, there's going to be this huge resurgence of indie films and non-union films. And the reason why I say that is it's because of simplicity. It's less yeah. paperwork. It's, we no longer live in the era where it's like, hey, A-side talent is SAG. It's like, bro, anybody can be A-side talent if you put them in the right um, uh, role and give them the, the proper direction, right? So Yeah, and I think that's, I, th I, I, I completely agree, dude. Like the, I grew up playing sports too. I played baseball for like 10 years. I played street ball because mm -hmm. I was poor. You don't need money to play street ball. Anybody could do that. Um, so I understand, I understood at an early age, my role 
competitively in sports. Sure. You know, I wasn't the biggest guy, but I knew, um, all right, I can pass. I'm fast. I'm defensive, you know, and um, I think to your point, like you, you don't need SAG talent or, you know, as long as an actor understands their role and if they're right for the role, then it'll be good. You know, absolutely. I think that it's at its current rate. That's why the industry has shrunken so much over the past, you know, four or five years is because the current model that's in place is unsustainable. The yeah. amount of money that's burning to make a show that five million people will watch, it's not bringing in the money to even keep that show afloat and not even break even just to kind of cover costs. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. In today's world with streaming, you need a show to have like 50, 60, 70 million viewers. It's crazy. It's crazy. And and I and I and I always break the numbers down to people. I'm like, "Listen, if you have a regular, let's say PG-13 film or mm -hmm. or series, okay, so on let's use YouTube for example, you have full monetization, not partly, but full monetization. You're going to get and and this is also dependent on if people actually watch the ads and actually have a long view time. You'll yeah. get anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars per million views. So at ten million views, that's anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars. Where's the money coming? That's not even a Jenna Ortega salary. Like, where's the money coming from? Right. So it's interesting. So okay, so your time in LA, you're hopping around, you know, all that stuff. What was it like, like as an actor working? Like, what was your big your big things? What were your aha moments? Mm, that's that's a really good question um i think a big aha moment was i met an actor on a set on a film that i was working on and he was really good he had um technique mm -hmm. and i at that point i was purely instinctual you know i had not trained anywhere and um i just saw the way he was moving on set and i was like this dude's this dude's nice and um we we chopped it up and he was like oh i study at this acting studio he studied at carter thor uh, uh carter thor studio in um in the valley mm -hmm. and um he's like you should go audit and i was like okay cool so i went and audited and that was my first i guess aha like oh like there's a lot of technique that goes into this levels. And there's huh there's levels Oh, there's definitely levels to it. Yeah. And, you know, you're seeing one, first of all, you go in a studio like that, a really prominent studio, well-known, great reputation at the time. There's a, a lot of working actors. So you walk into the studio, you see like, oh shit, that's this person from this show. And, oh my God, that's this person from this movie. And they're like your peers. Right. Um, so I got really serious about my craft at that point, you know, and um, I was lucky enough for them to scholarship me there. I would trade, I would trade for, like, I would send out the scenes weekly. I'd go in and work three or four hours, but working those three or four hours at the studio meant that I could audit all the classes. Mm. Like I can go watch three or four hours of scenes. I could see, you know, where other actors, uh, troubles were and what, what they had difficult, difficulty doing. Sure. And I got a ton of reps in, you know, I was doing two to three scenes a week. One was like an on-camera class. One was a script analysis class. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot about gesturing. I learned a lot about my voice. I learned, you know, just my... Do you, uh, do you, our, our, our body is our instrument. Yeah. So, do you change like, your voice when you act? Uh, it just depends on what I'm doing, you know. Um, like, let's say, let's say not, like, you're not, I mean, obviously everything is a character, but let's say, like, your normal... Your normal roles, right? We're not talking about like a, a Cap a Jack Sparrow. We're just talking like normal roles. Do you change your voice or do you use the voice that you're using right now? I would use my voice. I think there's, I mean, we're, it's like we're pontificating what acting is. And like, I, it's like, I, I think authenticity, yeah. there's an element of me sure. as a human being that I need to bring to it and then doing what the character is doing. So I, I, I typically try to be as authentic to myself as yeah. I possibly can. Okay, uh, that's interesting. The only reason why I asked that is because for someone like me, naturally, I have a higher pitch, right? Yeah, like yeah. I talk with a lot of enthusiasm and excitement, sure. but when I'm acting, I start talking like this. And yeah. the reason for it is because I realize that to me, when I'm talking in my normal cadence, it uh -huh. comes across on screen too fast. Yes. And I had a problem in class that was very early on. He's like, slow the fuck down, dude. Yeah. 
slow down because for some reason it translates better on camera when you slow down yeah it may it, it, it might seem like you're talking very slow and deliberately yes but sometimes that is way more effective uh it, to the audience it adds the nuance right it's like the sure. nuance that that you know it's almost like if you do nothing on camera then so many different people can say, oh, wow, he's doing this or he's doing that or like what they can make up yeah. in their mind what's happening and you're literally just doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, for me to go in a lower register, um, I did practice that yeah. in class and I've done it on camera. Um, but it just, it depends. Like if it's a drama, it really depends on the character and, and the choices that I make early on. I try to limit my choices to like one or two, sure. um, small things. Um, but I'm a, like I said, I'm a smaller guy. So I, I, um, for me to go into a deeper range. Right, right, right. <laughs> wherever it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like yeah. you're five, five, like we don't believe you, you know? Yeah. And like, for me, I, you know, it's important that the audience believes what I'm doing. Oh, a hundred percent. For me, it's just based on genre. Like yeah, if, it, if yeah, it's yeah. comedy, then I'm yeah. more like, oh my God, Adam, you wouldn't realize what we're about to do yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And then if it's serious, that's when it's like a little deeper, a little slower. So, yeah. okay. So, so you're, you're acting, you're getting your reps in, you're going to class. What was like that one major technique that like, if a younger actor, first time actor, someone that wants to break into the industry is going like, what's that one technique that you learned that completely changed your acting? I, uh, re repetition. Okay. I think ultimately, I mean, it's a pretty simple thing, a simple concept, but like, I think the discipline of knowing your lines allows the actor to explore it and find new things. Mm. So if you're not completely off book, chances are well, the chances of magic happening are a little less likely. I think. When, uh, w w what do you use as far as, excuse me, technique to rem uh, memorize your lines? I do it over and over and over so and you over. Just repetition over. nonstop. Yeah. Like, and you know, if I can trouble my girlfriend to like, go back and forth with me uh, a bunch, then I'm um, sorry, I'm getting pink, but um, go back and forth with me. Or if I have a, somebody that's eager to run lines and do reps to be, then, you know, that's what I'll do. Um, I've tried everything though. I mean, I've like recorded the dialogue. I did two plays while I was out there and it was like, I did a play specifically that was 60 pages and two people. Shit. And, um, and being on stage for an hour and a half, is the highest form of stamina that an actor can have. Like I would, any young actor, any, any, anyone, like all of the really good actors that I worked with were their careers and their passion were, it was sparked on stage, mm -hmm. you know, and you could tell like that they had craft. Right. Right. I always say, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Because the, you know, you know, commanding an audience, a live audience, for an hour, hour and a half with words, it's work, right? You know, you have to be locked in. Um, That's another thing. No one ever tells any of these young actors that when you talk about stamina, yeah, to keep that same enthusiasm and do a take 20 times is a mental battle that you will have on set. Yes. Because at some point you're like, man, I just, I, I killed that last take. Like, come on, man, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> sure. Some directors want coverage and like, I'm one of those dudes. I'm one of, you know, the last two, I'm a coverage guy. It's like, yeah. you're great in that close up, but I need a wide or whatever the case, whatever the scene calls for. It's, um, I got to move the camera because, you know, and I'm a young director, you yeah. know, I, I, I don't, I'm still, that's definitely something I'm trying to figure out, but, um, I'm going to get to that too. Yeah. How, how, how you, uh, trans I just want to ask a little more about the acting, but how you transitioned into directing and producing. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, so from, from an actor standpoint, you know, you're out there, what made you, I guess, come back to Florida as an actor? Yeah, I, uh, it was the pandemic. Okay. 2020. I was living in Hollywood. Um, Los Angeles was locked down. Like, mm -hmm. Um, so I was collecting unemployment, but it was at that point that, um, I decided to make a pilot for myself, which is called short Adam. Okay. And I wasn't getting work. Nobody was really, we we're all locked down. Like at the, the industry had shut down. So I was like looking for ways to, um, 
you know, f- feed my creativity. Sure. And I honestly wasn't getting any lead roles, you know, opportunities for lead roles specifically in television. You know, I was getting independent. I've done independent. I've been the lead in independent films. And, but so I was like, all right, how do I break into television or how do I, how do I put enough footage together, um, to showcase that I can do television? Um, so I wrote, um, short Adam and I was just, you know, as a, at a necessity, I was like, well, I'm going to have to direct it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I had worked with another filmmaker and I was like, you know, will you, will you DP it for me? Will you be my cinematographer? He was down. And, um, that's how that came out. Like, that's how I ended up directing because I was just trying to make a pilot. But then you caught the bug. You got, you got yeah. the bug. Then I realized I was like, oh, I kind of like it back here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it was fun. And, you know, I'd been on other sets where you have to, I have to like, I see directors making choices and I see them getting lost on set or, you know, I have my own opinions about their production design or their casting choices. And, um, when I did short Adam, I had full control of that, you know, sure. I had uh, creative control and I was, and I, you know, at that point I'd been in LA for several years. So I, you know, I had friends that were working and kind of relevant, you know, I was actually Ubering too. And I picked up uh Joel McHale and I was taking him to dinner. Okay. Immediately recognized who he was. And I was like, uh, you know, we were chopping it up. We were stuck in traffic on the one oh one, And he was kind of like, what are you working on? Yeah. I pitched him short at him, not with any kind of like come and be in it. We we're just, we we're just talking. Right. And then as he got out of the car, he's like, what's your, are you on social media? And I'm, you know, I'm like, yeah, Adam Lopez dreams. And he's like, cool. I'm following you on Twitter. And I like looked and I'm like, he's only following like a few thousand people, maybe like 1500 people. Yeah. And he's got I don't know, a lot of followers. So I'm like, Oh shit. Cool. And, uh, so I ended up pitching him to be in the show. He makes a cameo in it. Um, my buddy, Charlie Baker, um, who was in breaking bad, he played skinny Pete. He makes a cameo in it. Um, I worked on a short film with Celia Emery, who's kind of like a national treasure in Britain. And she's in all of like the Bridget Jones diary. She was on the TV. She was on a TV show called better things on FX and she's in my show. So, so I like, so what I, said, I had all these pieces around me Yeah, and I kind of wrote for the strengths to my friends around me. Sure. And I was like, I bet if I asked Celia to be in the show, she'll play this part. And she did, you know, what was that? What was that? Uh, walk me through the feeling, man. Uh, Cause you know, your first project, it doesn't matter how good or bad it is always yeah. has a special place. So what was that feeling like? Like, like, okay, the day before you're about to start, you're starting, you have these people coming in making cameos that have done bigger projects and then your post-production and it's finished. What was that journey like? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it felt magical throughout the process of filmmaking. I mean, at some, at one point I was, I was shooting on the weekend. So we would shoot a day, a Saturday mm-hmm. and we'd shoot a scene or two and then I'd wait like two or three weeks or a month even, and then shoot another scene. And the the luxury that I had was I was the lead role, so I can control the co- my own continuity. Sure. And you know these my friends that were play- that are relevant actors, I'm asking them for a day of work. I mean, a couple of them asked for two or three because they were bigger parts. But um, it 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 was an uphill battle. It felt like um, I was just trying to get to the finish line and making sure that I was putting together a cohesive story. And I think it wasn't, you know, we were, we were pretty much close to being finished and I had went through three editors. Um, my first editor fell off and I don't, I don't, I'm not an editor, you know, I don't know premiere, you know, and that's something that I'm, um, learning now, but at the time I, you know, I didn't have that skill set, and, um, and it wasn't until I got my, to my third editor that it kind of clicked, mm-hmm. you know, like I found, I found not only my editor, but my business partner. And, um, that was the it, missing piece for you, right? That was my collaborative, like, yeah. soul, you know, yeah. like he's, he's my, he's, that's my dog, you know, like, um, his name's Skylar Sandak. And, um, we made that movie and we got Joel McHill in there. And then it was like, uh, you could, I could, I, watching it for me, it was good. It was watchable to me. Sure. And 
you know, we, you get through the edit and you're like questioning stuff and you're going like, fuck, I missed this, or I didn't get this coverage. Um, but when, when I got, got it sound mixed, I was like, that's pretty bad. good. That's it. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, this is nice, dude. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had a little, we had a pretty good successful, uh, festival run with it at the time. Like se- the, uh, new media category was like emerging because a lot of people were doing pilots in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Everybody was trying to shop a pilot. Um, yeah. So I think it was, I think when I, you know, and I had it mixed and colored that I was like, this is really watchable. Right. Right. Despite even it, it looks like it has a lot of production value because we're everywhere. Like mm-hmm. it moves a lot. That's um, that's the one thing that I tend to um I guess I don't want to say disagree with other filmmakers, but I think that one location shooting mm. to me is just boring. I'm sorry, like I, I get it, like you know, the writing could be really good, but it's just it's, there's not enough i i want to use the word eye candy right sure. whereas if you have even three locations right you go from a house to a gas station to mm-hmm. you know a bar like yeah. there, there's life because it, it's moving the story's yeah. moving whereas if you're only in a house right and let's say the family's getting kidnapped the kidnappers come and they're holding them in the house like okay that's cool like hopefully something interesting happens but I feel like for all the young indie filmmakers out there, if you're going to do it, just go as big as you can because you're either going to fly as high as you can or you're going to fall as hard as you can. And either one is perfectly fine. They, they're both in the same boat. I, I, I agree, dude. I mean, you, I, you fail, fail, fail and, until you succeed. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get... How, okay, so you, you got that project. What, what did that lead into, right? Because then you got the bug. Now you're like, okay, well, I can direct. So, oh, what so yeah, yeah. I guess you know. Answer your uh, how to end up back in Florida. I finished that, and it gave me enough confidence. I was super homesick. Like uh, my, I grew up in Orlando. I was born in Boston. I grew up here in Orlando. My mother was here. My brothers were here. And what nationality are you? I'm Puerto Rican. A lot of Puerto Ricans in Orlando. My wife's Puerto Rican. Yeah, there's math Puerto Ricans. <laughs> in Orlando. Um, and uh, and I, you know, I was missing home and doing short Adam gave me the confidence to go like, well, really enjoy filmmaking Mm -hmm. and I can do this from anywhere. I don't necessarily need to be in Los Angeles to, you know, be a creative anymore. And, you know, I wasn't really working that often as an actor, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it felt like I was doing odd jobs to survive more than I was being a creative. And that was just to be available too. Right, you worked the odd yes. jobs to be available for casting. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I could have done a really dope sales job and made good money, but then then I have no availability. Right. You know? Um, and that's always been my struggle in life, like you, you know, career versus like a job that you know is enough to pay the bills, but I can still be creative and and keep my creativity first. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I decided it was the pandemic. Um, I was like, I'm going back to, I'm going back home. Mm-hmm. So I drove back across the country, fit everything in the Prius, which, you know, I was also living out of the Prius. There was a period of time that it, the rent was so expensive that I chose to live out of, to sleep and live out of my Prius for six months to also finish short Adam because, you know, I had a box, uh, the opening is in a boxing gym and that location was like under 800 bucks. And, you know, there's expenses with making short Adam and like i'm crazy dude i was like you know fuck comfort i just yeah. want to get to the line um so i did live out of the car then you know i was living in a uh, hollywood you know that's so fascinating that it was a prius because there was a time where i was also living in my friend's prius <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> so, <go ahead. laughs> if you put the back seats down in the prius and you go to rei you get one of those like two inch inflatable mattresses yep um, I laid that thing down. I would like put like t-shirts over the windows and I found, I found a really great spot in the Hollywood Hills neck where like no homeless people or it wasn't yeah. sketchy. I was, I was living among the millionaires right. in Hollywood and I was sleeping legally sleeping in a parking spot up there where, you know, parking enforcement is yeah. not going to be. I always, I always say if I could if I could go back to 2000 like I wouldn't obviously change anything because now I'm happily married with my son and all this stuff but if I could go back to 2006 when I went yeah. out to straight out of high school I went out to California the one thing I would have done differently is I would have just bought a van and retrofitted it and then just lived in the van 
That way, when you get those $500 checks, $1,000 checks, whatever, you, yeah. it, you're you never worried about, you know, rent or where you're going to stay. It's, it's just so fascinating. Okay. So that all happened. You went to Florida. Um, you realized that you don't need Hollywood to create. You can create anywhere. And sure. I'm sure that now, like the people around you, they're excited to be a part of an Adam Lopez project. Yeah, I think th that's slowly happening. I think the biggest thing is I'm still fine tuning my team. Mm. You know, I have an editor now. Um, I have a producer and there's people that I enjoy collaborating with sure. and I can not take on the whole load myself. I can kind of delegate and trust, you know, especially my editor producer that, you know, he's, he ha he's as invested in what I'm doing as I am. Yeah. That's, that's super important to me. You know, like there's people that'll show up to your set, you know, sound mixers, you know, there's colorists, they're, they're day players, you know, they, they get gigs all the time and their rates are high and they're like, no, I'm not doing you any favors. You know, like I got to get paid. And, um, I have, I have a dog over here too. That's I, I like, I, I want to get up and then be like, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, hold on, let, but, yeah, let me do that. Cause they're going crazy now. Hold on one second. Okay. Yes, I was, I was, um, I think that's the, the point that I'm at, you know, I have a really good art director. Uh, I think packaging is super important mm. in the landscaping of independent film, um, putting together really good poster and trailers and, um, to get people to click and watch your content. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's where, that's where I'm at. And I'm also like learning to really take my time in pre-production, mm. you know, but yeah, to you, to your point. Yeah. I think if I were to reach out to people, first of all, I have the confidence now to reach out to anyone. Sure. Like, cause I have two films that I've reached that I've produced and directed and, have made it to the finish line and game changer when, and when people see your projects and they like the project, they like the quality and they realize that you put out dope stuff. Yeah. It's a game changer. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah, yeah. And it really is, you know, you have confidence that I'm not wasting my time. I'm not working with somebody that's cause I've done a bunch of films too, man, where no one's ever seen them. Sure. You know, they didn't get, they weren't released for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, I try to, you know, add as much value to whoever I'm working with and go like, like trust me that like, this will be good for you. You right. know, not wasting your time. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a fascinating aspect when you go, cause my path is very similar to yours where I started out as an actor and then transitioned into yeah. a filmmaker. And one of the big reasons, and I'm sure that you could probably relate to this, but one of the big reasons why, I became a filmmaker was I wasn't getting the roles to not even to audition. I wasn't getting any of it to that would satisfy, I guess, my soul of creating. Sure. Right? There were no, Oh, you're, we're going to put you out for the lead guy or this and that. It's like, Hey, can you do this for the gas station attendant? I'm like, I don't really give a shit about that gang. You can give that to anybody. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, that's, a, I, I'm, I'm, I was always there. I always, I was kind of a yes man. Like there was no uh, part too small, but it was always a little like disappointing when you'd go like, you'd get the audition and it was an under five and you're like, okay, you know, yeah, you because, know, three lines. Yeah. You're trying to get, you know, anything like I always, and I see it today on big movies, whether it's on Netflix, Prime, it doesn't matter, but you'll see where it's like, man, you could have gave that to anybody, anybody off the street could have said those lines, but they'll still... Not to say it's wrong, because I know it's part of the process, but they'll still hold a casting, hundreds of people coming in. And it's like, bro, you can deliver that line in any way. In any way, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. it and it, it is, you know, it's just, it's every project is so different. And every director or cast director. So there was cast directors that, you know, knew that I was reliable. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I would get callbacks or I'd be put on a veil and like, I'd get let go, man. Like, and so enough heartbreak. I was like, I just want to, I just want to be a part. I just want to be a part of like the bigger picture story element of, of storytelling and just like 
either give myself an arc in projects or be responsible to tell the story and and make watchable movies. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. And so, like, that's why that's why we're here. I mean, like, I just really enjoy it. And now, like, I'm obsessed with making it full time. Right. Like, I want I want my production company to be my sole source of income. Right. And and how is that going? Right. You want it to be your sole source. How is that going for you? Because you've done two projects that are completed, seen the finish line. You're, yeah. you're constantly working on it. You got your editor now. You have the vision. How was that going? So I guess Short Adam finishes. I come back. I'm doing a festival tour, I guess, if you will. Yeah. I'm with it. And I move back to Orlando. Um, I get more. I get commercial. I, get, I got a commercial agent out here, a theatrical agent. And then we, we played Short Adam at the uh, Orlando uh, Film Festival. And there was an old friend that I knew, Glendy she from when i first started acting and she came to support short adam and show some love and she was telling me that she wrote noche buena and i you know just just being friendly i was like send it over i'd love to read it and give you notes i didn't have any expectations mm -hmm. um i took my time with it i sent her notes i thought it had a lot of potential and she's like well we're looking for a director and then that that landed on my lap yeah so I was like Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> and so she she kind of was, you know, very green. And she was like, do you think we could shoot this next month? And I was like, no. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I need like a year of pre-production. She's like, for real? And I'm yeah. like, yeah. And then once once we're done with it, we're gonna, I'm going to need another year of post-production. Post. Um, yeah. And it was really, really good because, you know, she was so ambitious. She matched my ambition on that project, she was so excited and that new energy, you know, she hadn't been jaded by the industry. Yeah. She didn't, she didn't know like all the, pen, you know, I was, I'm always worried about all the things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I have a backup plan for something because I've been a part of things going wrong, you know? So it's like, you have to have a backup plan. And so we went through the process of making that film. We finished it and we released it December of 20, I, a super rushed release. Mm -hmm. I was able to get it. It's a Christmas movie. Um, you were able to get it out in December, <laughs> five days before Christmas. Perfect timing. And um, I wish I, I and honestly, I wish I would have, we would have gotten out in November mm. uh, to give it some time to build. But it did really well on Amazon within a month. Okay, like, it did really well. And then I I took on the task of going. We had I had opportunities with other distributors that were interested in the film but at a high astronomical percentage, they wanted a, a big cut of, uh, of the revenue. And it just, the math was not mathing for me. Nobody right. was adding value to it. Nobody was going, well, we're going to run these ads or we're going to spend this amount of money. You know, it was just like, we'll get it up on these platforms for you and we'll see how it does. Yeah. And I think, well, why can't I just get it on the platforms myself and I'll see how it does. Right. You know? Um, and so, um, uh, you know, that's when type a, which the brand type a entertainment, my production company, which I had started before short Adam, I was like, well, all right, type a entertainment's doing distribution now. Right. So we decided to self distribute, uh, Noche Buena and, you know, it got it up on 2 B it's on, uh, prime and it is on, um, Apple TV and the Roku channel, and they're still coming in. And I have a really big television premiere for it, December 9th. Um, I don't want to announce where it's yeah 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 it is, but like uh, December 9th, we're we're gonna be airing on television. So we got broadcast. Um, yeah, man, and there's no middleman. Yeah, it, it, I, I'm, I, the whole goal is I want to get my investors their money back. Right. And, you know, I'm very confident that I can make that, um, that we, that we can make that happen, yeah. you know? And I think for the most part with filmmakers, that's kind of the way forward. You know, you hit up the film hubs, you know, whether you go to Amazon direct or whatever, self distribution for most indie films that, that does not have a big star attached to it is probably more than likely the way to go because a lot of distributors are not offering MGs. And unless yep. you're going to get that universal line of distribution and it's going to be in, you know, 175 countries, yeah, it's, it's just not 
worth it in my opinion because most uh, of those distributors, they rely on you to do the marketing and, and the marketing spend, you know, they'll say, um, let's say there's not a cap in the contract. So you're like, hey, make a $10,000 cap on the marketing expenses. They'll yep. put out a couple posts on their social media and be like, oh, that costs 5,000. Yep. Did it really though? <laughs> right. Or they just outsourced it to a publicist and then charge you money. And then these little fees, they add up, you yeah. know, it's like, uh, it's taking away from essentially your, your profit sharing. Yeah. And sometimes they don't even, you don't get to profit sharing with these dis di distribution companies, you know? Um, and then you're playing the excuses game and then you're, you're locked into a five or seven year contract with that specific distributor. And you're like, uh, but I'm so e you're eager. Mm -hmm. At least I am. I was eager to be like, no, I'm going to work my ass off to contact, um, platforms on my own. And different people from acquisitions and things like that and you know like i said we i we brokered our own license you know with these, with this television channel and well the uh, big thing is you went from an actor to a businessman right essentially when you go and start your own production company you're taking your career into your own hands because now you can put yourself in any position you want yeah right um, yep. do you feel like that's the way moving forward for any actor that wants to be successful? Like, do you think an actor can just be an actor in 2024 and moving forward and be successful? Sure. I mean, this is, yes, yes. I've, I've read a lot of books on autobiographies and I think I have my own opinions. They're just my opinions, but like there are truly magical individuals out there that, um, command your attention. And I think a skilled eye um, finds those people. They think those people always, you know, it, it may seem lucky, but it, the, the fact of the matter is that you, you can't help but not watch them. And I think you don't necessarily need social media or, um, or to be a filmmaker to, to have that kind of success. I think the, the ingredients to these special outliers are that there's like an air of mystery to them um they're dangerous um they just there's something seductive about these special kind of actors and they're, they're just like everything else there's levels to this shit um but my personal opinion is you don't need to necessarily have that but i do i also do believe that if you do have all of these qualities that you still need to work on the craft and i think what sustains any actor's career is being committed to really dedicating your life to the craft of acting and storytelling um that answers your question yeah no no it does it does it's interesting because I, I i like to especially someone that's that has an actor heavy resume i like mm -hmm. to ask that question to kind of get the perspective of that person because my pers my perspective is very different yeah right? my perspective is is like the opposite it's like man i don't think in today's world the way that the industry has moved and the way that human beings consume um i don't even want to call it media i'm going to say consume attention mm -hmm. right because everything whether it's video games youtube instagram TikTok, shorts facebook's movies they're all to to hold your attention yeah right so I think in today's world, my dogs are going crazy. Um, but I think that an actor, because the opportunities are so much more limited than what they were even when we were out in LA, right? Yeah. That pool that used to be a hundred is now 20. And you have, if you look at like film festivals or anything or any big movies, those are all legacy stars. Sure. Outside of like, let's say the five, the Zendaya, Ortega, Timothy Chalamet, uh, forget the other, but like outside of the, that small group, it's all legacy actors. Yeah. Whereas when we were growing up, like, how do you? I'm 38. Okay. So I'm 36. We're, we're in that same park, right? That when we grew up, a lot of the actors coming up were like, newer actors they were fresher actors sure right that became these big stars so i think that in today's world moving forward not to say that you can't because you're right when you have the lebrons of acting those outliers yeah. they come yeah. in the attention yeah and i like you you mentioned timothy chalamet and i don't think he's on social media 
I don't think he has like an Instagram. And to my point is what I'm saying is, and obviously, you know, he didn't just come out of nowhere, but he had that thing, Mm -hmm. you know, and like he didn't rely on social media. I'm sure he has an incredible team around him. (laughs) One hundred, he has to. (laughs) And and they're brilliant. And they're brilliant, right? Yeah. yeah. What I'm saying is, you know, he's a he's one of those actors that he's you want to watch him. Mm -hmm. Like he he commands your attention, and he doesn't need social media or the gift of um, of filmmaking to sustain his career. Although I guarantee you, and I don't know, but he's probably producing content because it's just good business at this point. He's right. got money. And so he's getting access to higher profile projects. And it's like, um, it's like a no risk bet for him. He's like, fuck it. Yeah. I'll, let's produce it. I can't be in it, but it's great. And so I, I think a lot of you know, success stories, you do end up ultimately producing content. Like that's a goal of mine where it's like, you know, I, I want to get to a point where if I don't have the time to produce everything that I'm doing that I can entrust somebody else with my money and go, I believe in it. Here you go. You yeah, know? Yeah. But, but yeah, I, you know, I hear what you're saying. Me personally, I need to do things like this. I need to, you know, work. I'm, you know, I don't work on my YouTube channel enough. Yeah. I don't work on, so, you know, I'm in a weird place where like, I don't want to be on Instagram posting everything that I'm doing. Yeah. I just, there's a, there's a certain amount of privacy that I want to have. I was out there though. I was out there posting on Instagram all the time and like talking at the camera and doing these things. And it's great. I had a po- I did a 10 episode podcast on, on uh, YouTube called the struggling artists. I mm-hmm. think this is great for creative momentum. Mm-hmm. I think it's great for networking. I didn't know who you were, but like I'm currently I'm at a place where I'm like, my privacy is important to me and the work is even more important to me. Yeah. And I don't, I don't necessarily need to prove to anybody anymore that what I'm doing on my own time, I'm working. So to, to, to dive into that, right. It's very interesting that you say that because you said, I don't need to prove anything to anyone anymore. Do you, would you say, cause I'm going to dive into that on myself uh, in a bit, but do, would you yeah. say that a lot of that comes from the fact that you've made your own projects and you filled whatever that little void was is now full? Yeah, it, that it's once you, it's hard to describe once you, cause the roller coaster ride of making long form narrative work yep. is crazy. Mm-hmm. Right. And once you get to the end of once you get to the finish line, there's this like immense, like you, like, I can't, I just did that. Right. And like the new thing is like, I can do it again. Right. And you don't need anybody else. And whether or not people like it, you're, you're learning that it's for you. Mm-hmm. So I used to think that uh, I will get respect when I do this right. or when I get this role or I make this certain amount of money. And I think the healthier thing and the less ego uh, driven thing is to just really be dedicated to the, to the work. Cause yeah. the work is really what it, if you, if you, I've been doing it for 20, 20 plus years. If it was about those things, I wouldn't have made it 20 plus years. Right. Like I love this. Right. I like there's, I just love it. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's not, you figure out, Oh, well, and if that comes great, like, you know, then I'll, like a crazy person, I'll throw that money back into the business. Yeah, you know, because I love it. But it's, I used to, I used to think it was like, you know, certain, uh, certain like ego things that I've, you know, I've had trouble with. Yeah, it, no, no, it's such a fascinating thing because, like, for me, I used to feel the same way, right? It was yeah. like, man, if I reach this level of success, if I do this, then I'm good. But after uh, making my own films that bucket or whatever that is of having to prove to an exterior source is gone. It's like, I yeah. I could not do another movie again and be completely satisfied or satiated. Right. It's, right. it's one of those things where, um, as an actor, because we both started out as actors, you yeah. have this need of like, I have to prove myself, but then yeah. once you start making your own projects and this message is really for, the, the filmmakers out there or the actors that are like, man, I have this idea and I want to do it. Go do it. Because once you yeah. do it, it's like it changes your entire perspective. Like you yeah. even become a better actor 
when you start yeah. becoming a director because now you know exactly what you know really scott wants behind the camera because you've done yeah. it yeah i mean it's like it it's funny dude i came back and i'm actually doing a student film right now yeah um as i'm writing my next thing yeah but like just to keep that just to keep my body going and just to be on set you know it's like this is this kid's 21 years old and it's like you know i'm looking at him going where's my mark and i'm going what's your edit yeah. you know what are you thinking about and i'm not trying to make him feel inferior to me but i want to understand what he's thinking right. so i can be more effective for him in the edit yeah you know in terms of my performance um and i only know that because you know, when you're editing, you know, you're like, shit, I, I missed that, sure. you know, um, or I wasn't clear about, um, direction to a certain actor and, you know, you take responsibility for it. So, well, that's such a beautiful thing that someone like yourself started out in Florida, you went to LA, you've done a bunch of projects, you started your own production company, you did your own films and you're still, uh, humble enough to go work on a student film. And the reason yeah, why no. I say, yeah, I'm not better than it. no, but, and, and that's why I think it's so crucial for, you know, people that are coming up or even that people that have done it, like maybe, you know, even have an adjustment to the perspective. It's like even myself, mm -hmm. I've worked on projects where I've gotten paid like $40,000 for a day of work. Big, yeah, big commercials. I've done films, print work, all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I still to this day, like, uh, will do a film for free just because I have the time. Yeah. Be like, yeah, I'm down. I don't really care. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. But that's the mentality that I think helps nourish that craft we were talking about earlier in the conversation, right? You're practicing mm -hmm. that muscle. Yeah. You're, ha you're forcing yourself to learn that dialogue. Now you get to go play. And fortunately for you as an actor, uh, when you do student films, free projects, paid projects, low budget, it doesn't matter, that you just have to show up and act. You just have to play. Right. Yeah. They got to do all the work. <laughs> right. 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 I, uh, yeah, it's been really nice and it's just, it's good to be around creatives, you know, that are just starting out in their career. I, you know, I believe that, you know, I just try to be open to what li life is giving me and the opportunities that it's giving me. And like, you never know who on that set is going to be a big collaborator for you mm -hmm. or who's going to go on to do something really amazing in their life, or you just never know. And I just try to be open to it. And it's just exciting to see everybody so excited, yeah. you know, at yeah. that stage, you know, cause I've also worked with people that, you know, are not so excited anymore and it's work for them. And that's fine because there's some really good workers, yeah. you know, there's some people that are really good at showing up to work. Um, Would you say that you collaborate with a lot of the same people? And the only reason why I ask is because I collaborate with the same actors on every single film. That's cool. Um, I like to bring people back. There's a certain language that, you know, there's a certain understanding that you have yeah. with people. And so, you know, if I'm, I'm not the best with words, sometimes I'm not the most articulate person, you know, and like, sometimes my face says it all, or I'm just like, do it again. Yeah. And like, you know, <laughs> they're, like, they're like, he doesn't like it. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. It's not that I'm not saying that I don't like it or you're, tr you know, whatever it's that they know that I'm not satisfied. And usually the, you know, when something's good, I get so excited. Yeah. And like the people that have worked with me know when I'm excited that it's good. I think it's good. Yeah, it's good. What are you, what are you working on next? Um, like what, what do you have lined up in the near future that you want to kind of get done? Well, I mean, so this journey now it's like, I'm going, I feel like it's so crazy in my life. I'm the next thing for me is premiere. I want to get good at editing. I think that's going to help me as a filmmaker. Sure. So, um, it definitely will. And, um, and I'm writing another feature. Uh, it's, I think I'm going to do another, um, romantic comedy. Yeah. Um, uh, and hopefully leverage into a bigger budget, you know, more responsibility. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of it. And, you know, and then like, like if I get commercial auditions here in Orlando, it's most it's a commercial, this is a commercial town. It's mostly commercial stuff, but you know, every once in a while it's a little indie or I was going to ask about that. How is it uh, being an actor in Orlando? Yeah. Commercial town. It's yeah. mostly commercials, you know, um, we do get the occasional, uh, big budget, but I feel like a lot of them go, to, are going, go mostly to South Florida, yeah. like Miami. Um, 
but sometimes you know i get those sides and i get an opportunity to play so you know just staying open to that it's not there's the numbers for my, me personally i just don't i don't i never really got called in a lot like when i was in la like the really good weeks for me were like three or four um auditions in a week and that's like an amazing week right right like you know if i was getting one or two a month then that was that's kind of where i was living yeah I had one or two opportunities uh but yeah i, I hear it's more about work-life balance and writing discipline did my own discipline of writing i have to write what's like, your what's your discipline on writing because i have a uh, a very simple discipline it's write one to three pages a day and you'll have a script in a month or three months yes i uh right now i'm completely if i'm being honest completely um negligent <laughs> yes like like i'm i i i my writing process is like i see scenes and then if i see it in my head and i'm i'm, I'm meditating on it then i will bang out like pages oh, okay um but i really because i've also never had the discipline of being a writer you know sure. uh, but i really need to get up in the morning and just you know 5 30 in the morning just write like you're saying one to three pages and yeah. like that's that the dudes that are you know have are prolific like yourself that's what they do yeah you know what it's a thank you for that it's a uh it's it's a thing where you know if you wake up at 5 30 for like for the longest time i was waking yeah. up at 4 50 and i stopped that but if you commit at, at, like let's say you're like hey i want to get this project done and you commit literally one to three pages yeah that that pace of a turtle gets you so much further in life and it can be applied to everything so for example when i edit a movie i edit a scene that's it because what happens is if you try to do five scenes then yeah. the fifth scene is not edited as tightly as the first three right, right. you start you start racing to finish compared to doing it well but taking a lot longer so right if you commit to one to three pages, yeah, it, it only takes you 20 minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I completely agree. Then you come back and you can worry about things like pacing and yeah. whatever else, but you've, you've committed to that scene. So you know that you were so specific in your choices with, with freshness, mm -hmm. and not like eagerness, you well, know, or trying to trying to get to the end. And to your point, right? What it allows for the the individual that for yourself, you see scenes. That's kind of how I operate too. I see the scene. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Once you write and you, you your story, the, the characters start kind of living their own life as you're writing. When you stop, you have a whole day to think about like, oh damn, what would Susan do? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then you let it flesh out in your mind and then you go back the next day. Um, yeah, because the problems, it, also, it's problem solving. You know it. Yeah. It's like there's a problem that needs to be addressed or something that needs to be answered. Yep. And uh, you can really sit back and like think about like, oh, how am I going to fix this fucking problem? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If Let me ask you this, man. For the, for the actor that's coming out, for the person mm -hmm. that wants to start their film production company, what's the best advice that you would give them? Because um, this is 20 plus years of experience best i mean i guess i guess just leap in the net will appear you know that it's just just kind of kind of go for it you know and um and serve yourself like serve serve your soul mm. in, your, in your creative pursuit i think you can't go wrong when you're serving yourself i think if you're serving yourself you'll find your audience I agree with that. I always say that uh, when you get to do something creative uh, that you naturally enjoy, whether it's painting or acting or anything, that your soul gets to eat. Yeah. So feed your totally. soul. <laughs> totally, dude. Like, I mean, otherwise you're just, you're going to be, you're going to have like burnout and fatigue and I don't know, just get down in the weeds of like what other people think and worry about what other people think and I don't know, it just kind of, that can get in the way of things. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Tell the audience, where can they find you, follow you, you know, on cool. social, even though I know you don't want to do social media, I don't want to do social media, but uh, uh, we have to in 2024. Yeah, yeah. Where can people follow you and, and follow your work? Um, so my website's uh, typeaent.com, Type A Entertainment's my production company. My personal Instagram is Adam Lopez Dreams. 
and um, Type A Entertainment's also on um, Instagram. I mostly focus on Instagram and the website, but also my YouTube is Type A Entertainment. So you can find us on there too. Awesome, man. Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you so this much. Great. 